break. I only got about 30 seconds left here. I got to start Johnson's Improbable History of Pop, which will be cool. Guest Ben Upham with career view of keyboardist vocalist Lee Michaels will be featured this evening. But right now, I need to let you know that this program is funded in part by Sports Cards and Blues Headquarters, offering over 2,000 blues titles, Ibanez, guitars, and harps in all keys, located on Highway 2 in Airway Heights, right next to Subway Sandwiches. And the blues is also funded in part by Rings and Things, featuring jewelry, gifts, and beads from around the world, now celebrating a third year in their Skywalk location in River Park Square, near the Bon Marche in downtown Spokane. Have a great week. I'll see you next Saturday. This is Bruce Davis. You know, they picked me to do this because I'm one of the guys in this band. We'd like to have you come down to the next free. Once again, you're listening to uh, KBBX FM and KSFC Spokane at FM 91.1 and 91.9, respectively. Time for me to scoot on and uh, scoot on out of here. It's time for Johnson's Improbable History of Pop. And uh, that's funded in part by 4,000 Holes, buying, selling, and trading new or used records, tapes, and compact discs at 1502 North Monroe Street. This is John Johnson for KPBX FM, and welcome to Johnson's Improbable History of Pop. Lee Michaels was born as Michael Olson on November 24, 1945, in Los Angeles, and began playing rock and roll as a teenager. Skilled at guitar, bass, saxophone, trombones, and keyboards, Michael's first name band was The Sentinels, a Southern California surf music outfit. In the mid-1960s, he began writing his own material and, now concentrating on the electric organ as his main instrument, signed a solo contract with A&M Records in 1968 after moving to San Francisco. What followed were nine albums over the next seven years, two of which became million sellers. He was, in fact, a major concert attraction for most of the early 1970s and is certainly one of the more musically adventurous performers to make a commercial breakthrough during that period. Yet today, he is, to put it bluntly, mostly forgotten by the mass audience. A series of critical reappraisals during the last few years have caused many to take another look, and the response has been quite positive. With us tonight to share his views of and music by Lee Michaels is Ben Upham of Spokane, who's been a guest on numerous episodes of our program. And Ben, I guess you'll be telling us a bit about some first-hand experience with Lee in California as we go along. Oh, yeah. I, I used to cut meat for his cats years ago. Okay. Hey. Big, big cats. That's first-hand experience. Horse meat. Horse big meat. Cat. Yes. <laughs> That's how I met Lee. I worked in pet stores then. And uh... Well, what is it about his music that attracts you? Well, I think uh, initially it was probably the song we're hearing in the background, Do You Know What I Mean, gave the exposure. And then after I'd heard that, I immediately went out at, you know, I was 14 at the time. I went out and got all his back catalog and started spinning them and, and realized the diversity there. I was more of a guitar-oriented uh, rock fan at the time, so to, to hear somebody uh, playing the keyboards the way he did was was very exciting to me. Now... Do you know what I mean was a top ten hit in 1971, and isn't the story that he wrote that in like a half an hour or at, 45 minutes? At 5 o'clock in the morning, I guess, uh, he's, he claims he woke up and the lyrics came to him, and he basically says it's a throwaway song. It was going to be a B-side, but the disc jockeys flipped it over, played it, loved it, and so did the public. And that's all you get to hear nowadays. I call the radio stations and go, yeah, the guy made all these other records, can we hear something else? And they don't know of anything else. Oh, well, they've got a, a good hour coming up then to open up their minds and ears a bit. Indeed. Because you're not going to be hearing, do you know what I mean, again during the course of this hour. No, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> and don't... <laughs> what is it we are going to be hearing first? 
Uh, well, first, John, why don't you tell us the first cut, being you selected it. And we did collaborate on the selection of uh, songs for tonight. It's from his very first LP, which I've always had a real fondness for, called Carnival of Life, which has uh, real some psychedelic edges to it. It's got elements of blues, pop, soul, uh, ornately arranged, almost, I've heard it described as Baroque psychedelia. Recorded uh, in a studio in Los Angeles, 1968, the early part of the year, came out. Didn't do particularly well, but looking back on it, it's got that certain something extra that it has aged extremely well over the last 30 years. So we'll be hearing tomorrow from Carnival of Life to get us started. Okay, and after that, I uh, selected a cut off of his third album, self-titled Lee Michaels, from 1969. And it's the blues standard Stormy Monday. Uh, but listen to the keyboards. The organ playing is very reminiscent of uh, John Lord of Deep Purple. It's uh, very wild, and Lee has some wonderful vocals there. And we will go from that to uh, one of my very favorite uh, Lee Michaels tunes, The War. I've chosen the live version, which was released in 1972. Um, it's, a, it's an older song. It was on his second record, but this is a live version of it, and it's... Uh, very politically strong lyric. Right. He definitely did have some comments to make about the Vietnam War at the time. He did not like the war and he didn't sympathize for the people that were fighting it. He, and he let that be known. At the time. Boy, that's right. A, that was okay. Interesting to hear his perspective on that today, looking back in this uh, in this era of the wall and some of the other things going on, but uh, that this was in the early 70s and it was an emotional issue. Oh, yeah. And he made his feelings known. A great vocalist will be hearing his pipes starting right about now. This guy could hit some high notes that others couldn't touch. Better try to mind. You better 
Just heard three songs by Lee Michaels with special guest Ben Upham of Spokane to get us started on our special tribute retrospective called Do You Know What I Mean? And Ben, uh, we just heard War preceded by Stormy Monday and from the first LP that was uh, tomorrow. In the background, we are hearing a bit of first names from a interesting LP. Uh, tell us a bit about this uh, this issue. Well, Space and First Takes was uh, the studio album that Lee put out in 1972. It features a lot of guitar on it and very, very long, jammy songs. There's like a uh, 14-minute and a 16-minute song. Um, I think it's wonderful. It sounds very improvised in the studio. And Lee's playing some guitar along with Drake Levin of uh, Paul Revere Narrator's fame, who's doing most of the lead work. Um, and Drake had been playing off and on with Lee f- since back uh, days of the first album, I believe. Was he on the first? I he's know he's on he... the first. He's on uh, the second. For sure, he's on Barrel and Recital, the second one. Yeah. So huh, that's interesting history. But in some ways, this album was daring. It was maybe commercially suicidal because uh, he just had a million seller. Now he's putting out an album with only four songs on it, two of which are 12 minutes or longer. Well, it's you know it was, I think, doing what he wanted to do, uh, being in control of it at that time. And the two shorter songs on there uh, are both compatible for radio play. So I think he was doing a little bit for them and a little bit for him. Great. Yeah, it did take a lot of adventurism and a lot of commitment and uh, courage to really put it out in that form. And if I'd had the foresight at the time, I would have more information here because I was actually invited to one of the recording sessions for that album. Didn't make it. I was, uh, I think I had a baseball practice. <laughs> Darn. Living for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, as I look back, I really wish I had gone, but it, it just didn't happen. Now, the third LP that he recorded was really the breakthrough as far as sales, wasn't it? Yes. That, yeah. It, uh, I don't believe there was a, you know, a commercial single off it, but yeah, it, it, uh... The third LP called Barrel? Third LP LP was Lee Michaels. Okay. Barrel would have been the fourth, um, in 1970, but I believe it was the third album, Lee Michaels, that, that, uh broke him. It was sounded so much more like his live sound, and I think that's what people were going for, because a lot of people were, were seeing him open up shows at, at the Fillmore's, and uh, this sounded a lot more like his live performance. It was live in the studio. Okay. That was the third one. Now, the first two got some radio airplay, not much. The third, the fourth, the fifth, sixth, seventh got pretty good radio airplay and sales, and then it kind of tailed off again at the end of the 8th and ninth. I'm just a short encapsulation of the history. I know we're kind of jumping around all over the place for this program, but Lee Michaels' music does that, too. Well, it's nice. By jumping around like that, we're getting more of a smattering of the styles here that he that he was able capable of. Oh, good save. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're doing here. What is it we're going to be hearing next? Uh, if next, I've picked a cut that comes from the same album as Do You Know What I Mean, and it's uh, sort of another pop-sounding song along that vein called You Are What You Do. It sort of lyrically reminds me of instant karma meets you are what you eat uh, theology, but I like it, and it was the first song I ever remember hearing true stereo in. I had my head between some speakers and for the first time heard the person coming out from between the speakers. It was very interesting. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, um, it was it was in our fireplace, too. The speakers were on either side of the fireplace, and I could have sworn Lee was inside the fireplace. It was very strange. But that's another story. We will yes, go... Yes, We'll follow that up with um, another lyrically... Uh, so- song that I like lyrically, and it's got some wonderful uh, harpsichord in it, uh, Your Breath is Bleeding, which comes off the uh, Nice Day for Something LP, which was um, number eight. Yeah, in 1973, and okay. he had he had Keith Knutson drumming with him uh, from the Doobie Brothers on that one. And uh, okay, good. And we'll follow that with uh, one that means a lot to me, another political one from back around the Vietnam era called Thumbs, and it's about hitchhiking and finding alternatives to going to fight in the war. Very good. Another slice of Lee Michaels, and uh, in our next uh, talking segment, we'll explore. My own theory that uh, Elton John is nothing but the sanitized version of the Lee Michaels musical style. 
How about that one, huh, Ben? I can't wait to hear hear about it. <laughs> Look at 
Kicked in the background a bit of Carnival of Life, the very first song from the very first Lee Michaels album, Hello. And with special guest Ben Upham, you are listening to Do You Know What I Mean? A career retrospective on Lee Michaels on Johnson's Improbable History of Pop on KPBX-FM and KSFC-FM Spokane. And just uh, want to elaborate a bit, Ben, on my theory about uh, Lee Michaels actually set the blueprint, and maybe consciously, maybe not, for everything that Elton John followed up and cashed in on so successfully from the early 70s on. By that, let me elaborate here, we're talking music only, not lifestyle or uh, opulence or any of the flash and dash and all that. Uh, he was a sanitized version of what Lee did. Uh, you, you were mentioning the word gritty about Lee Michaels. He certainly was. He had a lot of rough edges, a lot of Another word for that is maybe uh, integrity, controversial lyrics, a lot of jamming on his albums. They weren't predictable. They had three-minute songs, 30-second songs, 10-minute songs. Elton John would not do any of that. But what Elton John did take, though, was that uh, excellent soulful uh, lyrical style and uh, vocal style that Lee Michaels brought to the table and the uh, keyboard playing, which is basically fairly simple, not a lot of flash and crash and not a lot of long, you know, eight or ten minute solos. Elton certainly, uh, I think, picked up a lot of Lee Michaels' blueprint and just kind of, you know, maybe put it through the uh, bleach cycle. I know what you mean. I think on the earlier Elton John, there's definitely a, a, co a good comparison there. But I think I would listen to Lee Michaels myself. Oh, yeah. Boy, no, no doubt about the choice, but I just think it's kind of interesting how the commercial marketplace works. But uh, anyway, that's my uh, pet conspiracy theory for this program. Well, I'll look into it. If I find out any, <laughs> any uh, proof, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, uh, help me uh, get focused here, Ben. Uh, what, we mentioned a bit about the different bands that Lee Michaels had through the years, and to me one of the more interesting ones was the two-man band he had for a while. Tell us about that. Well, the two-man band was really a, a real powerhouse. Uh, Michaels was playing very, very heavy, loud, electric uh, Hammond organ and doing all the bass lines himself. And it's, it's most evident if you're going to go out and pick up some Lee Michaels uh, music uh, and you're in for the heavy, the heavy organ sound, I would go for um, the, the self-titled uh, third album just called Lee Michaels or the Double Live, which features just the two-man lineup. Um, and who was that second man? I believe Keith Knutson was the drummer on the live one. Uh, Frosty was the the other drummer on the uh, self-titled. But it's a it's amazing how much sound can come out of two guys. I, I know uh, there's a quote that Lee Michaels wanted to make his his organ sound like Led Zeppelin, and it uh, I think it's closer to Deep Purple. But um, that's that's why I've been trying to vary what we're hearing here from the the heavy heavy organ stuff to some of this heavy guitar stuff that we're getting into, and then, of course, there's going to be some uh, mellower uh, piano pieces that I'm going to try and get on here shortly. But there is something to choose from. There was enough uh, on the plate so that one could go for the uh, the heavy stuff, the uh, lighter, the, the bluesy style, the uh, psychedelia, whatever. There's something to choose from, and not concentrating on one specific style and hammering it into the ground like a lot of artists do just to make a buck is a real attribute for Lee. Well, plus the fact that by listening to any of these tunes, if you've, if you've heard anything by Lee Michaels, especially other than just his hit single, but you're going to know right away that it is him, even though he's doing these different styles. He's very, it's very distinctive voice, and there's usually a keyboard in there somewhere. What is it we're going to be hearing? Uh, coming up, we've got uh, Didn't Have to Happen, which is, uh, like I was mentioning, one of the mellower uh, acoustic piano pieces off of uh, the fifth release, which was uh, from 1971. Uh, next, we'll go to a, a song I've always enjoyed called Drink the Water, which is off of Tailface, which was his final legitimate release. Uh, came out in 1974, Tailface. And after that, we're going to go back to Think I'll Cry, which is another very nice mellow song off of uh, Barrel from 1970. Very um, good. There, there is one other Lee Michaels album I'm after. It was released only through mail order in 1981 called Absolute Lee. And that, I don't have anything I can offer up from that. I took the 
magic trips But now I know there's nothing I heard the songs of joy It was a gift of more But now I know there's nothing Didn't have to songs today to all that's left to play but somehow there's nothing with all the good they bring to all now sound like dreams I kiss that something didn't have to have to happen that way I hear the screams of pain Although the screams were plain And now the gone Oh! 
Just heard three very tasty, sensitive piano solos, mainly by Lee Michaels, special guest Ben Upham. Those were your selections, right? And all had some meaning to you. Yeah, they, they're they very mellow, and I thought that's a good thing to show this side of Lee. As well as he can rock really loud, he can also, you know, have, have very delicate songs like that. And, yeah, they go back for me to early high school, you know, eighth grade, high school stuff, and, and I... I remember these songs as hearing them the first time and then they kind of stuck in my head after that and 
It's nice to get him on the radio. I don't think I've ever heard him on the radio and didn't ever expect to. Hey, only on Johnson's Improbable History of Pop. You bet. But uh, we've kind of hinted about uh, what's been going on with Lee the last few years, just very vaguely, but uh, what basically, how do we cover that? Uh, he hasn't had an album out since 1975, officially. His last album was a uh, odd one, to be sure, and we'll be hearing a sample from it as we wrap up our program called Tailface, where basically he abandoned a lot of the things that he'd done in the past, put out a kind of a power music guitar album. Uh, but he has been active, he has been uh, healthy these past 25 years, right, Ben? Well, as far as I know, he just he wanted to get out of the spotlight. He had done enough of the music industry, didn't need to do it anymore. And uh, I guess he, for a while he owned a music store in Mill Valley um, called Prune Music. Um, I don't know what year he sold that, but then when he moved down to L.A., um, he was had something to do with a restaurant. He owned. He was part owner of a restaurant, and he was restoring a, a an old uh, theater. Uh -huh. And more currently, the only news I have on him at this point is that he is currently producing a movie, and uh, and still recording music, but not releasing it. So I, I don't see. know. I don't know if there's any intentions. I hope to find out here in the fall. I'm hoping to talk with Lee and and find out uh, when we're going to get to hear some new material. Who knows? And I know he also spent some time in Hawaii. And the rumor is that he is one of the few artists from that particular era who invested their money quite wisely, particularly in the real estate market of Southern California. So uh, he has uh, made the right moves uh, since leaving the music industry, it sounds like. Yeah, it sounds like he just he didn't need to do it anymore, and uh, therefore he didn't. And uh, perhaps at uh, some point, too, we'll have a chance to hear uh, there'll be an official issue of some of the legendary jamming he did with Jimi Hendrix. I've only heard rumors of it, but it sounds awful good to me. Sounds good. Well, what, uh, what is it we are going to be wrapping up with? Well, we're going we're gonna to close off with uh, the Garbage Gourmet off of uh, Tailface which uh, is your selection, so I'll, I'll let you describe the song. <laughs> it certainly was, Ben. Uh, Garbage Gourmet, uh, hard to describe. You just have to listen to it. It is outrageous to the max, and you'll pick up on those lyrics in just a second. kind of encapsulates uh, a lot of uh, 70s uh, events and lyrical happenings, I guess, at the time, and uh, maybe it's not a throwaway cut, but it has every indication of being something that was just kind of tossed off at spur-of-the-moment conditions in the studio, and uh, I dig it from his last album, Lee Michael's Tailface. Go 
And special thanks for tonight's program. Go to Ben up on the Spokane for stopping by, sharing your views on Lee Michaels and music by him. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure. And uh, maybe we'll catch you again for another program with another neglected artist here in a few months. I'll be back. Sounds good. Thank you. Next week on Johnson's Improbable History of Pop, I'm a truck, a symphony for 18-wheel rigs. Music by Commander Cody, Del Reeves, Terry Felt, and many others. This is John Johnson for KPBX FM, and many thanks for listening. And John, we thank you and Ben once again, right here on KPBX and KSFC Spokane. Listener-supported public.